thank you for joining us today for this um, webinar into human factors for offshore and hazardous industries. My name is Nigel Blumeyer. I am the chair of the Hazardous Industries Group, and I'm well. Uh, I'm joined by Rachel Hendren from the Offshore Group, chair of the uh, Offshore Group, and our speaker Pippa Brockington, who I will go into a little bit more in a minute. Um, <laughs> it's yeah, it's fantastic to see so many attendees, and I also wanted to thank Rachel for her help in putting this webinar together. First of all couple of housekeeping items. Um, as you've seen in the chat, if you do have any questions you want to go and put to Pippa, then please put them in the Q&A box. Um, if you do have any issues with audio, visual, uh, audio or video problems, put that into the chat box and we will go and try and help with that. And as you can see in the chat box at the moment, if when you go and do attend this, you can use this for your CPD portfolio as well. So all of that's in the chat box. What we did want to make people aware of is we're going to go and have the last 10 to 15 minutes uh, for questions. And if we don't get through everyone's questions, um, we will go and put the answers onto our LinkedIn group pages so everyone can go and see the questions and the answers that were there okay so hopefully that'd be good and just remember that this will be up on youtube in the near future so you can go and review it at your leisure so let me introduce our speaker um we're kindly joined by pippa brockington who is a fellow of the chartered institute of ergonomics and human factors and lead author of their guidance on carrying out safety critical task analysis she has more than 20 years of experience of applying human factors in a wide range of industries, including high hazards industries onshore and offshore. She's an ex-principal specialist inspector, try saying that out loud 30 times, for the HSE. <laughs> um, Piffer is now Director of Human Factors Expertise Limited, a consultancy that provides services and training in human factors to all types of industry. So, Pippa. Thank you for joining us. It's now over to you. And uh, if you could kindly share your presentation, that'd be much appreciated. Thank you, Nigel. Will do. I hope. <laughs> so hopefully that is now working. That is working. Thank you, Pippa. Over to you. Brilliant. OK, well, welcome, everybody. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit um, at a high level about human factors and uh, how they should be managed in offshore and hazardous in industries. So in this presentation, I'm planning to talk about why human factors is important, why we should be considering it. I'm going to touch on the regulatory framework. I'm not going to go into too much detail there. Um, I'm going to talk a little bit about how people fail and some key performance influencing factors. So performance influencing factors, also known as performance shaping factors or error producing conditions are what they say on the tin. They're the factors that influence human performance. OK, so why is human factors important? Well, if you uh, have um, ever searched online for human error, you will find that human error is the cause of everything that ever goes wrong in the world. So uh, these are all new stories that I found during a general Google search on human error. So apparently, um, Virus outbreaks are res res result of human error, plane crashes, train crashes, ships turning over, um, the uh, uh, dam failures leaving fishermen dead, uh, industrial gas explosions, domestic gas explosions, and apparently more important than anything else, oh sorry, supply chain problems, and more important than anything else apparently are incorrect um, outcomes of football matches, <laughs> which uh, I've been told by my nearest and dearest is really important. Slightly more seriously, um, almost all major accidents that have occurred have some form of human error that have contributed to them. And it's I'm not going to go through um, every single one of these accidents, you'll be relieved to hear. Just um, You can look at the details of them online if you're interested, but uh, I just wanted to show the range of major accidents that have been pinned down to human error as a causal factor. So we've got Chernobyl, where 
um, the um, operators continued with the test plan well past um, after all sorts of safety problems had kicked off and they were overriding safety systems to allow it to go on. We've got Kegworth um, in the middle there, that's uh, plane crashed into the uh, embankment of the M1 after the pilot turned off the only working engine. We've got Cerveso, um, which major environmental disaster where essentially the company that bought, bought them out, um, they were asset stripping and they got rid of everyone who knew anything about how the plant operated and eventually they uh, overheated it. Uh, we've got um, Bhopal, the worst ever industrial accident. It's, uh, I've, I've put a slightly traumatic photo up there. Apologies if that upsets anybody, but most of the pictures of the plant don't give an indication of how serious the event was. So 20,000 people were killed um, by the Bhopal, which was probably caused by a maintenance error. We've got um, Texas City down here in the corner uh, where the operatives overfilled a uh, raffinate splitter column. Uh, it was supposed to be filled to nine feet and they filled it to well over 90 and then overfilled the pipework and the stack as well. Um, we've got uh, Jaipur, that's that big fire here where they failed to put a blind in properly and ended up losing the containment of a, an entire um, storage sphere of petrol, Herald of Free Enterprise, where they left the doors open, Piper Alpha, again, following maintenance, uh, lack of um, proper handover of a permit to work, poor communications, the um, fast suppression system was left switched off after a diving exercise. There were so many things that went wrong in Piper Alpha that I can't do it justice. And more recently, offshore, we've got Deepwater Horizon, where um, installation of the um, blowout preventer was incorrect and so it didn't work when it was needed and the huge environmental damage that was caused by that as well as um, more than 11 lives lost. So all of these major accidents have at some core part of them people making errors. So there's a so what question to that and this is a quote from Trevor Kletz who's uh, it's a real guru of process safety. He he was either the inventor of or the chief proponent of intrinsic safety on the basis that if you don't have it, it won't leak. Um, and he said this, people say most accidents are due to human error, and it's true, but it's a bit like saying that falls are due to gravity. And, he, and he's quite right. Um, we can't do anything about gravity. Uh, equally, we can't do anything about human error. Human error is just something that will be with us as long as the human race exists. Um, but what we can do is understand the conditions that allow human error to occur and cause a major accident. We can look at what makes human error more likely and what we can do to prevent human error and what we can do to prevent an error turning into a major accident. And that is what the discipline of human factors is all about. It's about understanding why people get things wrong, what's making that more likely and crucially doing something about it. So I'm going to touch now briefly on legal requirements, but because of the audience, I'm assuming you know the legal requirements for your area, um, whether that's um, uh, offshore safety case regulations, uh, prevention of fire and explosion, um, the uh, dangerous substances and explosive atmospheres regulations, the control of major accident hazards, good old Health and Safety at Work Act. I'm assuming you know what the legal requirements within that are. I'm just going to touch a little bit on what about what that means for um, managing human performance and managing human factors. So at the core of um, our uh, regulatory framework is this idea of risk assessment, of understanding where the risks are in your organisation. So I put it down briefly as having identified hazards, assessing risks and implementing control measures, but you could add in there knowing who could be harmed and how, and also recording your risk assessment and reviewing it regularly. Um, so in your major hazard risk assessments, you should be identifying where your systems are vulnerable to human error. So where could human beings, by their action or inaction, cause um, a risk to be realised? But also, where are they, by their action or inaction, preventing a risk being realised? So where are you relying on, in, in coma terms, where are you relying on human beings as part of your necessary measures to control or reduce risk? Um, and um, you should have that firmly built into your risk assessment cycle. So 
typically hazards, hazards, um, uh, for meekers or for meers, uh, or whatever major hazard risk assessment you're using, even if you're using five steps, should be identifying where operator error could con contribute to risk or contribute to a control measure. And where you can understand that, where you understand that you've got that reliance on human performance, we should be conducting something called safety critical task analysis. So the core guidance on safety critical task analysis was produced by the Energy Institute in a document called Human Factors Safety Critical Task Analysis. Um, slips off the tongue. Uh, most people call that SCTA for short. Uh, it's the same approach as the HSE seven steps approach or um, essentially Sherpa or um, human reliability, uh, qualitative human reliability assessment. So whatever you call it, you should be applying the process that you can see laid out at the bottom there in the orange boxes. So identify your critical tasks, prioritize them, analyze them, um, identify the potential errors, identify PIFs and engineer those out. And I've put up that new guidance there um, just to make sure that everybody's aware that it exists. Um, so this guidance has been produced by the Chartered Institute of Ergonomics and Human Factors. Um, so I was the lead author of it, but I was joined by a group of really experienced practitioners and um, it's been put together to support the Energy Institute's guidance. If you think of the Energy Institute's guidance as telling you what you need to do on safety critical task analysis, this is talking about how you do it. So it's really practical guidance on exactly what how you go about introducing a program of SCTA. Um, so what resources you need, what competencies, how you do um, a task analysis, how you do an error analysis, how you tie it back into your major hazard risk assessment. So it's free to download from the CIEHF website and I really recommend you have a look at it. The point of all this is to reduce risks as low as reasonably practicable and we need to think a little bit about what that means in terms of human factors. So the uh, image on the right there is taken from um, HSE's guidance on R2P2, reducing risk, protecting people. And it's um, the stuff, the wording on the left is taken from the guidance on the coma regulations. So what does a LARP mean in terms of major hazards? It means that relevant good practice should be adopted as a minimum. This is what both these are, are showing you. Relevant good practice must be adopted as a minimum to be in the TIF LARP. So that's tolerable if as low as reasonably practicable area of risk reduction. And then you should be asking what more can you do to reduce risks and be able to explain why you've not done it if you haven't done it. So if we look at relevant good practice as our minimum for human factors, are you aware of all the sources of relevant good practice for human factors, starting with the very basic but and old but still relevant HSG 48, um, which is um, reducing our, blimey, I forgot what it's called, <laughs> uh, reducing error and influencing behaviour. <laughs> Um, which is the core guidance from HSC on human factors. Um, so there's really good stuff in there. It's quite dated now. But there's also a lot of much more specific information available to people on things like design of control systems, design of alarm systems. Um, uh, there's um, a lot of British... Um, European and international standards looking at human factors. The um, Institute of Oil and Gas Producers also have uh, brought in some really um, excellent guidance on um, integrating human factors into design. So there's lots and lots of um, relevant good practice out there that, it, that you kind of need to know about in order to demonstrate that you've reduced risk as low as reasonably practicable. But I want to bring it back down to the bottom line here. It's essentially about knowing where you rely on people as part of your risk reduction measures and have it being able to say, we know that they'll be reliable in carrying out those tasks. So what are people doing that reduces risks and how do we know that they're reliable? And there's something here about monitoring audit and review of your control systems as well. Are they working as you expected? Are, are you reducing risk? If you're interested, the pie chart that I've used to illustrate this slide um, was taken from a study done of loss of containment incidents in the UK over a five-year period. Um, 
the bit that on my screen appears as yellow, the biggest slice here, um, these, this is information taken from HSC investigations of loss of containment incidents. And it's an analysis of the causal factors. So the big yellow slice there was human factors, specifically human error and the human factors that contributed to the loss of containment. This, um, this slice, which on my screen looks blue, um, is, is management, whatever that is. <laughs> uh, but that's generally people. And the green slice is risk assessment, which is also generally people. So you can see there's a really high uh, degree of um, people involved in causing loss of containment incidents. OK, so let's talk a little bit about understanding human failure. Um, uh, I want to uh, survey you and find out a little bit about you. So I'd be really grateful if you could, um, preferably using a mobile phone, but you can use your computer as well. If you would go to a site called menti.com, you can use the um, QR code in the bottom corner to take you there. Um, or, or you can just type in menti.com. It's there. It's there at the top of the screen. And when you've got to that site, it should ask you for a code. So it's an eight-digit code, and it's this one: six six eight one three seven eight three. And I'll just give you a minute to um, log on to that and and get to it. I'm just doing it myself too. I can see how long it's taken. Taking. That's probably on the wrong one. Okay. So I'm going to start the Menti now. And if you could answer the first question, which is, are you a competent driver? I'm really enjoying the maybes. <laughs> so when I do this face to face, I um, often find that people are reluctant to put up the hand up because they know perfectly well that I'm then going to ask a question which casts doubt on whether they're competent or not. I wonder if that's the maybes. <laughs> Okie doke, we got to 79. Uh, people have contributed. Thank you very much. Okay, so I'm now going to. Um, Ask another question. This, this, uh, oh, we've gone up to 80. Still rising. Okie doke. So, competence. I, I've never been to a site where, um, there hasn't been some reliance on this thing called competence as part of risk reduction measures. So, it's really, so it's, I want to explore what that means a little bit. This is why I'm asking this question. I've got another question for you, though. So let's let's start that one off. Um, so we've got 72% of you think you're, comp think you're competent. 23% are saying maybe. 5% <laughs> are saying no, which might possibly be because they're not drivers or they really don't want to be caught out. <laughs> um, Okie dokie. So the next question if it will let me move on. Well, hang on, we've got some more adding. So the next question that I'm gonna start up now is this one. If someone drives badly, do you believe they could have a fatal accident? So could they have an accident? Could somebody die as a result of it or possibly even more than one person? Yes, no surprises here. This usually gets this sort of response. Shooting up. Okay. So here we are. We're a group of, um, you've signed on to this webinar, so I know you're above average intelligent people. And uh, you're working in the safety profession. You're competent drivers. And you know that when you drive, you're driving in a critical system. Um, Okay, so you're driving a dangerous machine in a safety critical system. Okay, so my next question, if it'll let me get onto it, here we go. 
So have you ever arrived at a destination with no memory of the drive? Somebody said uh, in my course um, last week, it's that uh-oh moment where you've got, you arrive and you've got no remembrance at all of how you got there. What was the, what was that journey about? So we've got about uh, 90 people have been responding. So I'll just wait till we get there. This is a really common feature, especially on driving somewhere really familiar. So at the end of the week, um, when you're tired and you're driving home, it's a, quite a common thing to happen. So normally when I do this face to face and it's not being recorded for posterity, the question I ask is, have you ever deliberately broken the speed limit? So that's another question. You don't have to answer that question here. I don't want that. Um, <laughs> but if you've answered no to this question, have you ever deliberately broken the speed limit? Something to think about. OK, I think we've, we've probably, probably pretty much got there. There's another couple coming in. So we've got more than half of us um, who have uh, managed to drive somewhere without paying conscious attention to what we're doing. So if we think about that for a minute, so that's, we've, if you've driven, have you negotiated road crossings, roundabouts? Have you joined or left dual carriageways, motorways? Um, have you driven past schools um, or heavily um, occupied pedestrian areas? on this route um, that, that you've got no conscious awareness of. And this is not unusual. This is a very common experience amongst people. Now, often when we look at accidents, you hear people asking questions like, were they not paying attention? Or could they not see something? Or why did they not notice the blindingly obvious? And the truth is that if you are highly skilled and highly practiced at a task, you can carry it out without conscious attention, even if it's safety critical, even if uh, it's highly complex, like driving a car is, um, you can still do it without paying conscious attention. And this is being, um, this has been evolved in human beings in order to allow us to cope with the complexity of the environment that we navigate. So we do a lot of things without paying conscious attention to them. Walking, for example, we do without paying conscious attention. And in fact, if we paid conscious attention to that, we might very well fall over. <laughs> it's not something I advise you do in a hazardous area. So um, we're seeing here, um, a, it's a fairly um, normal result for asking this question. We're seeing here that even highly intelligent, highly competent people who uh, are very skilled at driving can do so without paying conscious attention. And perhaps that means we need to rethink about how competence serves us as a control measure. So it's just some food for thought there. Let's, let's explore a bit more. Okay, so... This is another question for you that we're out of the Mentimeter now. Um, this is just for you to, to reflect on yourself. So do we see the world with our eyes that like we've been taught um, since primary school? Or do we see the world with our brains, which may seem like a, a bit of an odd question. But I'd like us to just um, watch a, a short uh, clip from this video of um, an illusion that is a really stable illusion. So a lot of people get fooled by this illusion. Apologize in advance for the enthusiasm of the American narrator. <laughs> He's more bomb bombastic than is typical for Britain. So here we go. Let me back up for a second. This is the first part of a three part illusion. What do you see? Well, there's a window and it's turning, except it stops and reverses direction. So the window is oscillating back and forth. That's what most people see when they look at this illusion, except that's not what the window is actually doing. It's on this turntable and it is rotating continuously. 
This is known as the Ames Window Illusion, and I saw it on an old Australian TV program called The Curiosity Show, and I was curious. So in this video, I'm gonna dig deeper into this illusion than anyone has before. You know, the window itself is not a rectangle, but a trapezoid. You can see this side here is much shorter than this side over here, and that is essential to the illusion. Also essential, it is shaded to make it look 3D, but it's actually just a two-dimensional card with the same image on both sides. So now that you know exactly what this object looks like and what it's doing, can you correctly perceive the rotation rather than the oscillation? I still can't. It still looks to my brain like this window is going back and forth. Okay, here's an idea. I'm going to attach this Rubik's Cube to the short side of the trapezoid so we can keep track of it as it goes around. Are you ready? Okay. Okay, the Rubik's Cube is going around. Everything seems normal. But now, what is that? It looks like the Rubik's Cube is continuing to go around, but the window is oscillating back and forth. There goes the Rubik's Cube around the back. I don't even know what's happening. Whoa! Look at that! It looks like the Rubik's Cube is out drifting by itself, out in front of the whole illusion. What is happening? Okay, new plan. I'm going to take off the Rubik's Cube and I'm going to put a ruler right through the middle of the window. And so we can't possibly be fooled by the illusion, right? Okay, here we go. Okay, the ruler is rotating around. But wait, now the window is going backwards? Whoa! Whoa! The ruler is going through the window. It is doing things which I know are physically impossible, but that is how my brain is seeing it. Look, here we go again. The, the ruler is turning around with the window, but right about here, the window starts going backwards, but the ruler keeps coming. What is even, like, how is this possible? This doesn't make any sense. But that is the way my brain interprets this. It clearly prefers the illusion over seeing what's really happening, the continuous rotation. So I'll stop that there. And this is the, the point about this is we have a very um, practiced, very highly learnt um, perceptual set, that's the technical term for it, about what happens to objects um, which are distant from us in space. So the further away something is, the smaller it is. And our brain has experienced this over so many years that it finds it almost impossible to see something um, that's smaller as being um, nearer to us than something that's bigger. And that's what's causing this illusion, so that we actually see things we know are impossible when that happens. So again, we could ask, so what? Um, so this illusion is fascinating about how the brain works, but it's very um, difficult to associate that with the world of work. What does that mean for us in terms of work? And the, the thing to note here is that um, we are interpreting information that comes into us and we get about a million data points from our eyes every millisecond. And equal well about 10,000 points of data from our ears every millisecond and in order to make sense of that mass of data and actually be able to navigate our world our brains actually see what they expect to see they've got a strong idea of what should be there and that's what they that's what we interpret the information as we we are actually um experiencing the world from our brains rather than from our eyes now, this means that if we have a strong expectation about something, we cannot see something that's right in front of us. So, um, for example, I've investigated more than one accident where somebody has fallen through a hole in a platform that theoretically they should have known was there, 
Um, but because the lighting isn't great and there's various shadows on the floor, their brains have interpreted the whole as a shadow rather than as a whole. And that can have um, life altering consequences. It can cause a lot of damage to somebody. It can kill somebody all because they've misinterpreted or rather their brains have decided what's there and it's not what's really there. And equally, I've investigated accidents where people have heard information or instructions that they expected to hear in circumstances where there's a lot of noise or there's a poor radio signal and that's led them to make um, really serious errors. Um, in one case, uh, there were two guys working on uh, maintenance of a machine. One of them was in the machine tensioning a belt. The other was at the controls, um, waiting for the instruction to hold to run so the guy could check that he would he had got the tension right. And um, when, he, when he asked for a tool, um, the guy at the controls just heard what he expected to hear um, and set the machine running. And the guy who was, main, who was tensioning the belt lost his fingers in that incident. So these things have a real effect. So it's about making sure the environment and the way we provide people with information is done in a way that supports how the brain really works. The brain does not work the way we assume it works. It doesn't see what's actually there. It sees what it expects to see. And if we ignore that, then we are going to continue having accidents that are caused by perceptual errors like that. OK, so, whoops, what? go away. OK. <laughs> So I'm going to talk briefly about different kinds of errors that occur um, in, in human behavior and that are predictable in different kinds of human behavior. So when I when I um, asked you the question about if you'd ever arrived at a destination without any knowledge of, of the way there, that happens, that can only happen because you are working in a skill-based behavior. That is, you've learned the task so well that you no longer have to pay conscious attention to it. And the sorts of errors that we get in that kind of behavior are slips and lapses. So a lapse is literally forgetting something in a procedure, like, for example, forgetting to indicate uh, when you're overtaking or at a roundabout. That would be a lapse. A slip is right action, wrong, wrong object. So if you've ever um, got into an unfamiliar car and put the windscreen wiper on instead of the indicator, that would be a slip. Right action, wrong object. And it's because it's a reverse design to what you're used to. When we are working in less familiar circumstances, so we are um, having to work things out from first principles, where we're having to really think about what we're doing, so in what we call conscious behaviours, then um, we tend to make what we what are technically called mistakes, which is doing something, believing it's right because you don't have the right knowledge, the right information, the right skills to do it, the, do it how it should be done. And you believe that what you're doing is the right way of doing it. So things that can happen there are things like um, uh, an investigation I did where the operator responded to an, the upset plant um, as though it were um, a tank being overfilled when it was actually a reaction running away because there was no information screen that gave him the information that he needed. There were information screens, but there was no trending. There was um, no overview screen. Well, there was an overview screen, but it was so densely packed with information, you couldn't pick out the information you needed. It was too small to even to read the values. And... Um, it, that, that sort of mistake is based on not having the right information. Likewise, people applying a, a set of rules that don't really work in the circumstances. These are mistakes. And then we have these things called violations. So if I had asked you uh, for posterity, have you ever deliberately broken the speed limit? Um, my experience is that about 99.5% of people have at some point deliberately broken the speed limit, which is a very high rate. And that is a clear violation. So I'm not talking about going faster because you're following someone in front of you and you haven't noticed that you're speeding. I'm talking about deliberately breaking the speed limit. So it's a very high um, level of people breaking those rules. And if you ask them why they're breaking the rules, you get fairly consistent answers. So let's look at these a bit, a bit more. So slips, right action, wrong objects. Um, quite recently, one of the refineries was crashed, uh, crashed brought to a stop the whole refinery um, when the when an operator was asked 
to press an emergency stop button on a system that was uh, being taken out of use for maintenance, inspection and testing. And instead of hitting that stop button, he hit the one right next to it, which crashed the operational unit. And the ramifications of that is that the whole refinery was brought to a dead stop which is kind of dangerous in itself. It certainly tested that their emergency shutdown systems were working. Right action, wrong object. Um, it can happen really easily. Um, you can't train someone not to make slip errors. The only way you can get rid of slip errors is through redesign. So changing the layout, making it difficult to accidentally hit one of those buttons so that they're only hit with a forethought, not on automatic. Um, designing out the error, making it not possible. So the reason you can't train someone not to make slip errors is because they only occur in highly trained, highly skilled behaviors. So um, naturally, the more you train someone, the more automatic the behaviors become. Um, then they become vulnerable to slips. Likewise, lapses, so they're very common lapse in um, major hazard world is a, a tanker drive away. So drive away during loading or offloading where the um, driver loses track of where they are in the procedure and drives uh, drives away while still hooked up to the earth and the, and the uh, his hose is still in place and so on and it can uh, it can lead to quite a loss of containment um if what's happening there no no driver has any benefit whatsoever from driving away before they finish the loading or unloading task it's the you know, it's not something you're going to do consciously but it's not a slip or lapse either uh, well sorry it's not a slip it's not right action wrong object it's a lapse it's forgetting where you are in the procedure so not really so for some reason usually through distraction you've lost track of where you are in the loading and you get in the cab and drive away so you can't train out lapses and many times you see accident investigations where it's clearly been a slip or a lapse saying let's train the operator you can't train someone not to do a lapse because it happens in highly automatic behavior so it's all about design so just making it so that either you can't drive away while you're loading or unloading or um putting in something that helps with recovery, for example, dry breakaway coupling, because you know that the error will eventually occur. It's very infrequent, um, although it happens because there are so many tanker loads um, operating every day in the, in the UK. Okay, so mistakes I've put, the example I've put up is from Texas City, um, the Texas City refinery incident where they overfilled the raffinate splitter column. And I've shown an image there from the um, CSB video, which shows an excerpt from the shift handover log. So the offgoing shift had written in the shift handover log, ISOM, so isomerization unit, that stands for, brought in some RAF to pack RAF with. That's all it said. And because of uh, people leaving early, and people arriving late, there was no face-to-face -face shift handover. So the operators who were on shift didn't have an up-to-date understanding of exactly what the status of that plant was. And there was nothing in their screens that assisted them in forming that. We have on a, another picture from the CSB video showing the level indicator. So the level indicator only showed up to um, about nine feet because that was how far they were supposed to fill it. Um, we think the night shift put in 13 feet worth of um, hydrocarbons, but um, there was no way for the operator to know because once it got above um, 13 feet, the actual level indicator started to drop. So it was actually showing the opposite of what was happening. And a number of alarms that should have gone off had not been reinstated after the big maintenance campaign properly. Um, so the operator didn't have those warnings either. So mistakes occur when we don't have the right information and that might be because we haven't been trained in the task properly but it may equally be because our systems are not supporting us with the information that we need to understand what's going on and that can lead to some really bad um, mistakes okay so violations this is the speeding bit of it and uh, of driving <laughs> so they're deliberately breaking the speed limit um violations for there to be a violation, people need to know what the correct way of doing something is. So if there is no procedure or they haven't been trained, 
it's a mistake. It's only a violation if they know what they should do and they've been trained in it and yet they've decided um, to do something different. That's what makes it a violation. And when we look at accident investigations, and I've investigated a lot of accidents, particularly as part of the HSE, um, the most common kind of violation that occurs in accidents are routine violations. So these are violations where everybody breaks the rules all of the time. And where you have a circumstance where everybody breaks the rules all of the time, you've got a very good question there about whether that's a violation at all. That's that's just business as usual. That's custom and practice. That's how things are done around here. And it tells you something about the systems for managing uh, human performance if you've got a routine violation. It tells you something about the lack of supervision, about um, um inadequacies in competence management systems, uh, inadequacies in, in, in procedures, and it tells you something about how managers don't know what is going on in the workforce. So routine violations are the most common in accidents. Um, I've, I think um, the only other kind of um, I've seen is situational violation. So situational violation is where normally you do it one way, but something's wrong. So when I first joined HSE, I was peripherally involved in an investigation where a health and safety manager was doing a racking inspection. And normally he would have used a cherry picker to get it to the top level of the racking and inspect it. But the cherry picker was being maintained. So he went up on the forks of a forklift truck instead and he fell off and put himself in a coma. That's a situational violation. And if the situation isn't rectified, um, then it becomes a routine violation. So exceptional violations, are you can argue whether they're violations at all. It's basically everything's gone wrong. Um, the rules no longer apply, so you just do what you um, can to, to um, get the job done. And we've got optimising violations where you, people um, break the rules just to make life more comfortable. So quite a lot of maintenance activities involve access to... Um, in difficult situations, very cramped conditions or dirty conditions. And if people don't do the maintenance because they don't want to go in there, that would be an optimising violation. They're more common than you might think. Um, however, um, it's true to say that violations are usually well-meaning. They're about people trying to get the job done in the most efficient way. And it is routine violations that are most common in accidents. So if we want to prevent violations, it's about designing tasks to be efficient and achievable. Human beings like efficiency. We will find ways to make things easier, quicker, smoother and um, less effortful. Um, it's, it's we are designed to do that. It's not laziness. It's a, a, an evolutionary trait um, that allows us to constantly seek out the most efficient, energy, low energy way of doing things. Um, and I've specifically referenced that laziness word because it's often used in judgment of people who have not followed the procedure, they've been lazy. Um, no, we're just efficient. So we need to design tasks that are efficient to do safely and involving the workforce is really important. So not just um, checking procedures, but also writing them. So it's really common that a procedure is written in an office by a manager or by a designer, and um, that we call workers imagined. So it's how we think the work will be done. And then when it gets out into the real world, it doesn't work. And that's what we call workers done. How it's done in the real world it doesn't match the procedure at all. So get people who actually do the job and understand how it's done involved, not just in checking them, but in writing and contributing to the content. Ensuring competence. So this is not just what you do, but understanding why you do it a certain way. How do you keep people up to date on risk information? Probably the most dangerous things we do as safety um, people is drive our cars. Um, but nevertheless, nine, more than 90% of the population of competent drivers will break the speed limit. Why? Um, when was the last time we were trained? What, how have we kept our information up to date? Do we understand that risk? Have we lost our risk perception around driving? Very likely. Um, how do we encourage reporting of issues and problems? And then we've got the sticky issue of supervision. Um, it's easy to spot when there's none. <laughs> it's harder to say what good supervision is. Um, okay, so I'm going to skip on because I'm running out of time as ever. I have talked too much. 
So I'm just going to touch on a couple of performance influencing factors. And these are usually divided up into these four areas. So factors around the task, factors around the organization, factors around the individual. So that might be the design of a human machine interface. The organization might be the local culture, the competence management system, and the individual might be there, how tired they are that day, have, um, how, have, have they done the task recently? Those would be individual factors. And then we've got the environment surrounding that, which is things like the weather and so on. So just very quickly to talk about a few of these um, before I, I close for questions. So design stereotypes are, are normal ways of designing things uh, that we take as granted. So for example, if we have a, uh, a wheel operated valve like this, um, then there's a design stereotype that says right, righty tighty, lefty loosey. So you turn it to the right to close it and to the left to open it. And I've investigated accidents where people have done that. So they've walked the line, they've turned all the um, wheel operated valves as far as they can to the right and locked them off. And unfortunately, ended up locking a valve in the open position because it's been installed back to front. If that's a critical valve, that will lead to an accident. Inevitably, someone's going to turn that the wrong way because the design stereotype is so strong. And likewise, if you've got levers, the design stereotype is that it's open when the lever is in line with the pipe and closed when it's at right angles to it. If that's installed wrongly so that the lever doesn't work that way, you'll get errors on it. No question about it. Do we think about design of the environment? So the number of times people have shown me a procedure for a complex task that's carried out outside, which is just a big stack of A4 paper. I once um, walked a task through like that. I think it was a pigging, deep, um, yeah, pigging operation. And the whole procedure had um, disintegrated into a mush after about five minutes, thanks to the weather in the North Sea. Hurrah for the weather in the North Sea. Um, but we can, in fact, more rarely in this country, we can get people getting too hot. Um, and I've had uh, uh, people on chemical plants who fainted when wearing um, full chemical protection in, in hot weather. It doesn't happen as often. Um, I put in that graph there, which is a huge study done of about 20,000 um, activities, uh, which basically showed that once the temperature um, deviates from between about 17 and 27 degrees centigrade, once you get outside of that limit, you get an increase in unsafe behaviours. OK, so that that might be slips, lapses, mistakes, or it might be violations. But once you get outside of that temperature range, people start making a lot more errors, a lot more mistakes and a lot more violations, which is interesting. Um, lighting has a powerful effect on perceptual illusions. Is there sufficient light for the task? That's the bottom line. I'm not going to talk too much about that. So these are stills from another CSB investigation, this one at MGPI, um, where basically a sulfuric tanker arrived on site to be offloaded and the operator um, went down and unlocked the end cap. These are these are end caps here on the sulfuric acid line. In fact, that is the end cap on the sulfuric acid line. But unbeknownst to him, the um, sodium hypochlorite line had been left without the cap on. So um, instead of properly communicating with the driver which line he needed to connect to, he just took the padlock off and went, I've opened it and left. And when the driver came up, he then attached his hose to the first open line he could see, which was sodium hypochlorite, and they generated a massive chlorine cloud. 11,000 people had to shelter in place and 140 needed um, medical attention. So communication is a can be critical in, in yeah, can be critical in safety critical tasks. And we think about shift handover, particularly as a critical communication system and permit to work. But do we think about all the other communications that take place um, around sites um, that, that are critical to safety? So communications on radios, communications between team members. Um, and do we talk to people about communications? Do we train people in how to communicate effectively? No, we just assume that people can do it naturally. Procedures are the number one um, 
issue in all loss of containment incidents in the UK. And the, these are the common failures. So you won't be surprised by them. There was either no procedure or people couldn't get hold of it or it was out of date. Um, it contained, it was too long. It contained irrelevant information. It wasn't efficient. It wasn't formatted suitably, etc. These are all common problems with procedures. So having a management of procedure system that thinks about the design of the procedure, how it's used, where it's used, and keeping it up to date is really important. Competence, we've talked about a little bit. Um, I've put this one up because we have a tendency to assume that once somebody's joined the industry and started work and had that initial training, they are then competent. Do we look at continual updating of that competence? Because as time progresses and given the rate of change in technology, what was competence once might be out of date now relatively quickly. And this is something that we're really bad at with maintenance staff. Um, we say they're time served, therefore they're competent. We don't need to think about them again. We put all our efforts into maintaining operator competence. What about our maintenance staff who are also carrying out critical tasks? And do we have a management system that controls that? I'm really racing through these, sorry. <laughs> okay, so key messages, human factors are important for risk reduction. Human beings, we're all different, but we fail in predictable ways. We can prevent those, we can make them less likely uh, by optimizing performance influencing factors in line with relevant good practice. And safety critical task analysis is, is the core cool way we do that. It all comes back to risk assessment and that is the, the way to go and do a proper assessment. Safety, quality and efficiency will all benefit from that and it's a legal requirement. So that's the end of that um, and it's over to questions. So it wasn't too bad. I was only, only went um, six minutes over. <laughs> Sorry, Nigel. <laughs> no problem. Thank you very much, Pippa. Really appreciate that. And uh, we do have some really good questions to pose you now. Um, so I think everyone's gone and really appreciated that uh, overview of human factors and how it can sort of uh, impact in our various industries so thank you for that and i'd love to see the csb chlorine incident it's a good one isn't it <laughs> yeah if they color coded the pipes it would have been lovely <laughs> <laughs> anyway um i'll go and sort of pose the first question rachel if that's okay brilliant yeah. so um I, I think we'll start off with um the first one here in um people were asking how elaborate on the best methods for trying to go and get behavioral transformation within an organization how can you sort of bring these human factors into policy into procedure and other things like that i know there's some quite an open-ended question um could be an entire webinar into itself but i just sort of uh several i think <laughs> <laughs> yes Okay, um, so some people confuse human factors with behaviour-based safety and behaviour-based safety has its place. So, it, but it's not the whole of human factors. So I'm just, I don't know, I'm just putting that distinction out there. Don't, don't confuse the team. So my opinion is that you need, we need to design our workplaces and our work systems and our tasks to take make the best advantage of um, people's natural abilities um, in the first place. If we haven't done that, then there's very little we can do um, to get rid of human errors. And that's quite difficult when we've got aging planned. So my advice um, to companies is typically to raise awareness of human factors in the first place with management teams. Um, so uh, providing human factors awareness training as part of a package for, for all management and supervisory staff can be really helpful at just getting the message out there um, about the ways that people can fail and to get a better understanding of that. Um, it needs to be built into um, incident investigation so that you can help work towards developing a just culture where everybody's engaged in finding solutions but people are held accountable it's um, the the no blame cultures of the past never really worked people need to see people being held accountable but it's it's making sure that <clears throat> everybody's engaged in that process through educating them about how accident investigations work 
but also communicating the outcomes of them. So often accident investigations happen in a bubble and the majority of the, of the workforce don't hear what the outcome was, um, unfortunately. And believe me, the rumour mill gets messages out there. So it can very quickly undermine a culture which is trying to learn from instance if we don't communicate properly around uh, near miss and accident investigations. Um, okay, so I've gone the education route so far, but the other thing is having a constant, um, continuous, sorry, not constant, continuous program of safety critical task assessments, which directly involve the workforce in them at all levels, um, because then more and more people will begin to be involved in understanding how you can get rid of um, situations, conditions that increase the likelihood of human error. So that's a really, I mean, I've started the conversation. We could talk about that for days, um, I'm afraid. <laughs> I wish I had a magic wand. <laughs> okay, thanks, Pippa. Um, I'll take the next one. Um, so we've, this is a question with potentially no absolute answer. So I'm just okay. prefacing it with that. Um, in general, are a lot of accidents where human factors are a key cause due to lack of training knowledge or skills, or is it more cutting corners and neglig negligence? Try and get that teeth out. Okay, I would say um, the majority of accidents are systemic failures. Um, so, uh, I gave the example of where routine violations are the most common cause form of violations, but it's often not violations that are involved. Um, where they are involved, they're routine. That means that everybody does it that way all the time. So it's a it's a failure of the system where to have, there's been no understanding of what people are actually doing. And quite often that is then rooted in poor design. So I would say there's no, there is no, I can't give you the stats on it. Um, procedures are frequently identified as part of the problem. Um, which suggests competency is a big issue. Um, there's a, a core relationship with, between procedures and competence. So you need to have a procedure and people need to know what it is. Um, but I would say that we completely underestimate the impact of design. So most of the um, investigations that I've done, there's been a core problem with the design, either of how information is presented or the human machine interface. Um, the way the controls work or what people are ask, being asked to do. So things like workload and how um, efficient the actual task is. So I guess that adds up to very little negligence. In fact, I only, out of probably over 100 accidents investigated, I came across one, which was mean-spirited, if I can call it that. And that was... Um, it was bullying and it was some guys thought it was hilarious to shrink wrap somebody to a forklift truck and spin it in circles. That's the only malicious violation that I've ever come across. All the others have been well-meaning, trying to get the job done for the company, typically. So I wouldn't go to negligence as, by any means as your first port of call. In fact, it's the very last port of call. Well, I think that uh, we're very quickly running out of time so um i know i've only got through a couple of questions but as we said we will go and grab all these questions from the chat and q a and get pippa's expert advice on it and post it on the linkedin um you have got a little feedback form that's just popped up to all of you so if you could go and put in what you think of the webinar so we know whether to uh, um, bring the human factors back for another uh, shindig <laughs> And, um... It's not fair. I'm not allowed to vote, Nigel, and and it's asking about me. <laughs> next time, next time. Um, but hopefully, you've all kind of got a huge amount out of this. I know I have, and I really appreciate Pippa's time and her actually sort of uh, wanting to go and speak with our wonderful audience. So thank you very much, and I hope that everyone has a wonderful rest of their week. And uh, we'll go and leave it there. <laughs>